Hello, friends, and welcome. We are discussing the lighthouse today. Should be an interesting one for sure. Uh, yeah, uh, let's get into it. So, Susanna, will you start us off with an introduction? Hello, my name is Susanna Imaginario. I am the author of the series Timelessness, and I run a YouTube channel called Den of the Weird. And Chris. My name is Chris Mullen, from YouTube channel of same name, sometimes hang out at Patreon forums, and lover of films. We'll see whether I love this one. <laughs> it's definitely different. It wasn't at all what I expected. Yeah. I didn't really have an expectation. It just wasn't what I thought it would be. Um, <laughs> the first thing that, that kind of struck me watching it was, of course, the aspect ratio was... Mm -hmm. Um, it was a different and some it's there's al almost always something in the middle of the screen either there's an object or there's something that divides the screen and when there's not an object there there's something there's like a, like a divider that's the dividing point for something that's yeah. in the center of the screen there's always almost always something happening in the middle of the screen oh I don't remember that I've been noticed that. Mm. So it, it creates this idea of duality that runs throughout the whole film, this kind of two, this meaning of two, the screen split in two, the fact that there are the two men, you know, all of that kind of stuff that runs the whole way through it. Very, very, very clever, Steve, mm -hmm. um, in well, terms yeah. of picking that up. I didn't see it the whole way through. Now I have to say there are lots of points where I do see where it's like very much... Uh, I think one of the very first shots is actually a very central pillar where you can't see Thomas Wake at all. Uh, I think uh, Ephraim, Tom, goes and sits down in the bed on the left and uh, Thomas Wake appears from the pillar out. And I think that kind of sets the tone, I think, for a lot of the movie, which is, you know, this this feeling of, of a man divided. Mm. Oh, I didn't think of it that way. I just noticed it. <laughs> so that's interesting. Well, that's, that's, what, that's, that's what I thought of me, anyway. No, it makes sense. Um, definitely. Hmm. Yeah. So I, I watched this movie years ago, I think I watched it when it came out. And it was recommended to me by several people as a great example of an unreliable narrator in cinema. Mm -hmm. And I'm all about unreliable narrators, so it's like, yay, yeah, yeah, uh, Willem Dafoe, you know, what can go wrong? And it was not what I expected. <laughs> at all, uh, I I kind of pretty much I kept watching to the end, but I, I think I gave up halfway through just, just thinking um, how unreliable is actually this, and uh, if, if it if it was the right interpretation for the movie, um, and uh, my husband loves it, and mm. uh, w when we finished, he was like. It's amazing, and I think I asked something around the lines of, uh, right, is this what uh, what happens to men when they don't have sex for a very long time? Because that was the take I took from from the film. And I'm sorry, sorry to all men present, but it <laughs> kind of felt like um, a complete um, psychosis uh, that I guess it was triggered by whatever was in the water, but it was also triggered by their loneliness, uh, by the, dip, the deprivation of the place, not just for company, but they were in such a desolate place with no stimulus. Um, so they just started living inside their heads, just started winding up each other. Um, yeah, it's quite bleak. It's quite dark when, uh, I mean, I, I, at no point even though I was rolling my eyes, I was not, um, I was not laughing at their situation or their struggles or their hallucinations. I was feeling sorry for them because that that was such a waste of living, to be in, in that situation. So, what do you guys think? Hmm. So, there's so many different ways to to take this film, and I think there's it's very. It's very ambiguous because you can take it as he was crazy and the power dynamic between the two was one where he keeps getting pushed and pushed and pushed until he breaks mm -hmm. and the alcohol and the, mm -hmm. the fuel didn't help. And the other side is there's two men who are stuck on this island who, you know, don't really get along all that well. And 
they start to kind of go mad together and the lack of stimulus and the just a daily toil over and over and over and just the same thing uh, every day. And so, and you could take it as everything was a hallucination, like all the, the merfolk and all that's just them going crazy or there's a few different, so, or they're the, it's the same person and they're going, he's, they're some kind of hallucination there where it's, it's the same person and, or it's something where it's magical on the island and killing the seagull triggered all these other things to happen and they're being punished for killing like this more magical explanation. So it's, it's, there's a lot of, <laughs> of interpretations, mm -hmm. I think. I think uh, I think this may be a shock to a lot of women watching it, but that's exactly what would happen, men, in that situation. <laughs> like, I, base masculinity and testosterone uh, is almost certainly what will happen. Maybe not to the absolute extremes, but honestly, mm. the I have been in stag weekends that went on a day too long, and I can tell you when you're just surrounded by <laughs> other men, the need for language, etc. You would never be as verbose as William Defoe is in this at all. Like he's he's very uh, very well spoken the whole way through. There's, life descends into grunts and the, the, mm -hmm. like the lack of self care. Like I I think it's sort of fascinating portrayal of the two sides of masculinity. One's portrayed as being weak, and one's portrayed mm -hmm. as being strong. But the guy who's strong is the older guy who farts, who has terrible teeth, who has, you know, that that's the strong side of masculinity. Self-care doesn't come into masculinity. You know, mm. all of that, that side of mm. life doesn't. He is just projecting this superiority complex, kind of led by the idea that only he's allowed to touch the light. He can see the mm. light is, is the kind of bit. And because the other guy can't, it drives him mad, mm. both in terms of mm. trying to be the alpha male, but also in terms of what he can't and cannot have and what he's been asked to do and how he's been asked to do it, that kind of drudgery that he goes through. Um, mm -hmm. So, yeah, I, I think it's exactly how <laughs> it would behave in exactly the same situation. The base, you turn to base caveman at, at a some point mm -hmm. of, of the experience. And they, they do get close a few couple of times during their <laughs> drinking sessions. Yeah. yeah. Really kiss. Hugging, fighting... Yeah, I've seen that sort of behavior at parties when someone is really, really <laughs> drunk and not quite out of the closet. Yeah, and usually how it starts. I think you might be way more on that than you. Think. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, there's Question definitely tones Steve. of that. Hmm? Did you like it? Uh, it the, the, this is this is one of my things actually about the whole film. Right, so like, if if you had to pinpoint one way or the other whether you thought it was a great movie or you really enjoyed it, or, or what do you, what is your answer to that question? Because I don't think it's easy. No, it's not. I think the way it was shot in the cinematography is what stood out to me the first time. Um, the monochrome or the black and white really mm -hmm. add to it. Um, the acting, all the performances, all those things. Beyond that, when I first watched it. I kind of thought, well, when is this going to end? Like, what is going on? <laughs> and the, when it ended, I thought, I must have missed something. Like, there, there's, there has to be some, like, I missed something. Like, I, I have no idea what just happened. And then I, I've been thinking about it since I watched it. And I've been trying to figure it out and trying to put things together and rewatching it. And trying to figure out what happened and when and why. So I, I've, it's been on my mind since yeah. I finished it. And I'm trying to figure out, what is it about? Like, because I had a few different theories, but it, so yeah, I, I went from, I'm not sure about this to, I liked it. Mm -hmm. I think it's a movie you have to watch more than once though. And For that's sure. not an easy task because the first time you watch it, it's, it can be, it can be a slog the first time yeah. you watch it. I think it's, you have to watch it a, a couple of times over just to kind of pick up things. And once you know how it ends, I think it makes more sense mm -hmm. rewatching it and putting things together so i like it more and more as time goes but yeah. it was a tough watch at first mm -hmm. and you have yeah, to want to do sure. that too. yeah and it don't feel like it once it's over it's like okay it's over i'll watch it again one day maybe um 
because but I think it's necessary and then you're just talking about how the images were split I completely missed that um, maybe you have to watch it again without paying that much attention to the characters mm. because they just take the whole of the narrative and there's only two of them in that interaction so of course you're going to pay attention but maybe there's more being told just by the cinematography itself, the fact that it's black and white, and um, however, they're gonna. I remember there's being some very weird shots, almost in slow motion in the rain. It's like, where did that come from? Um, poses and, and the, the whole thing just got very weird at some point. So I guess mm, yeah. you need to to watch it again, just looking at that, not focusing on the characters, and maybe you find something. Yeah. It's of all the films that I've ever discussed with you, Stephen. A lot of them kind of skirt this this line. It's definitely an art house film, right? It oh, yeah. is definitely art house cinema, uh, and you, it, it's one of the reasons I hate scoring films because on a technical level, on an acting level, on a sound level, it is absolutely top tier of of mm. nearly anything that you can think of. It is one of the most beautiful, even from the aspect ratio, isn't even quite four three. It's one point one nine to one, as it turns out, which is so unusual. It's almost like a, an experiment in it, in its own right. The two performances are incredible the whole way through. Mm. Um and yet most art house cinema that I I generally do really like art house, that boringness is filled with your brain kind of going what's happening as you go along but actually as you quite rightly say steve i found myself the first time watching it not thinking about what's going on but just being kind of a bit bored by it you know what i mean it was very much uh, a drudgery the first time i watched it i actually fell asleep many years ago uh <laughs> it, it, it it put me to sleep and <laughs> sort of have a bit of ptsd from that uh but, but the problem i have with it is is that the main thought that i get from it being an house film and what it's about and all of that kind of stuff doesn't change from the start of the movie the very first thought that i have at the start of the movie is the same thought that i have at the end of it it doesn't really take me on a journey in mm -hmm. in the way that a lot of artists films generally do in terms of like introducing new stimuli or things like that and and the idea that this is just one person is just the quintessential thing that i get from the very start of the movie to the end that he's basically the same person and especially when he looks in the, the light at the end he basically looks at Willem Dafoe at the end of that of that sequence with the the tar or the muck whatever is on his face uh, making the full beard etc for him and so I don't get the journey I get a lot of incredible visuals I mean visually you could just have it on the background with no sound or, or otherwise um, and it would just be a picture you know what, what, what a thing although a bit messed up in places like the uh the, the mermaid sex scenes kind of out there um but uh <laughs> yeah there's always but that. yeah um I, i'm not sure whether i really really like this film i admire it i i would also if i had to rate it rate it four stars for what that's worth so that, that kind of tells you how hard i think ratings are because on a technical level it's it's hard to top but actually in terms of what i think it sets out to do and effective storytelling and making me think it's not the greatest example I can think of mm. um, and I, I like it, which I think he does the storytelling better in it, but it also does make you think as well so he can do both it isn't a choice an arbitrary choice between it's either this or that and I think mm. he can do it well versus somewhere so mm -hmm. yeah well, my first thought at the beginning I remember there's a shot when they are side by side and uh, it was that oh they're gonna die and uh, yeah, <laughs> exactly what happened. Yeah. I didn't think they were the same character. Got the impression that one was turning into the other character, but mm -hmm. uh, I, I missed whatever clues that might indicate that it was the same person. Even with the very limited dialogue, I think, Chris, to your point about you can just watch it on mute almost, because I had to turn subtitles on. I could not understand what they were saying. Yeah. But um, yeah. when you can almost eliminate, even with the very limited dialogue, you can almost eliminate half of it and still get the same story. There's a lot of mm -hmm. just kind of banter. I'm not sure that it means anything unless I missed it. But you kind of wonder, is this a movie that could have been half an hour or 45 yeah, minutes? It, and still it told felt the same like story? A, a short story. Yeah. yeah. And I think at that point, that's where the problem is. The ideas that are in it are the things that it's talking about, like masculinity. It's a, it's, it's an examination of 
you know, base masculinity and how terrible <laughs> it can be. Uh, it's an examination of duality characters, it's an examination of alpha male, it's all of that kind of stuff. It doesn't do lots with it, if you know what I mean. It just kind of stays at a level the whole way through. Um, the shooting of the two men from a filmmaking point of view like one is always being looked down on the other one's always being looked up upon so for most of the film that's looking up at Willem Dafoe and down on uh, Tom himself mm. and then it flips towards the end so uh, it kind of goes the other way around so it's kind of showing that like that stuff's interesting but from a storytelling or interest perspective I'm, I don't really get the flip other than he's a younger stronger man who snaps that's one of the reasons why I thought it was the same person because we do learn that his name isn't Ifram it's Tom and Willem Dafoe is Thomas I think he even tells him to call me Tom we learn later that Ifram is really Tom he's just on the run or running from something hiding from something I think even Thomas even tells him something toward like middle or end of the movie like maybe we're the same person or maybe we're you know so that's why I thought maybe there are a couple of scenes and maybe it's one of those things I could be misremembering but they do seem to get each other's actions mixed up so the bit where remember he's trying to steal the boat later on so he's trying to move the boat and then you realise it's a ruse to get into the house first the the lighthouse first should I say Mm. and it's Willem Dafoe's character that starts breaking the boat up with the spade yet when they get inside and they're talking about it Thomas basically says you were doing it you mm. were the person that was breaking the boat up so they there, there are a couple of moments like that where they get their action mixed up which I think indicates that they are the same person and then there's the guy the blonde haired guy the, the, the actually the guy who does look fresh faced the guy who does look like he's a newbie I think the inference is that he was killed from coming on the island and then he kind of, again, Elder Thomas, Younger Thomas, invents the other side. Uh, so there's still two of them. If you know what I mean? He's went mm. mad long before that. So, I mean, those are kind of my readings of it. But we see the blonde-haired guy so so rarely. You know, it mm. kind of gets confused with the mermaid and that kind of side of, of the telling of the story that it's hard to make any true inference about whether that is what it's trying to say or not. It's all kind of like speculation. Hmm. Mm. Good point. So the the man, the blonde haired man who we see and whose head is in the the ocean. That is that the previous uh, Swifty that was there. The or they call it Swifty or the, um, Taylor, not a Taylor Swift fan, but a yes. Oh, but I know you mean the the, the, new, the new guy. So he's either the previous <laughs> one or one that was due to arrive in relief. So the, mm. the one that actually we assume is Ephraim and Tom but if Ephraim and Tom and Thomas are the same person maybe that blonde guy was the relief and he was killed even before he really got to to take over or he was the previous one because that's sort of what Ephraim's going on about he thinks that Thomas the older man murdered the other guy but all of the points of view are all Ephraim if you know what I mean of him Mm -hmm. with the blonde it's never we don't really get inside Thomas's head when the first character in the same way as we do instead of Ephraim and he sees the blonde guy so it's almost certainly him that did did that and then gets it confused with I mean again this idea that if he did kill him and he's kind of he's equating that with sex I think because he seems to get the blonde haired guy and the mermaid kind of conflated in his head as being like extreme pleasure and that the problem that he has with <laughs> as Susanna pointed out of, of not having a sexual release kind of it all kinds of bit muddled in his head um, mm-hmm. but the problem I have with it is it's, that's exactly what I thought from the very start of the film in some ways again because of how the duality was presented um, so mm-hmm. that idea in it just became me looking for more evidence of what I thought now not to say that is exactly right it is that's the whole idea of art house cinema is that it can be whatever you think of it and what com- comes into your head but that idea doesn't progress for me from start to finish it just I just get more layers of the same mm-hmm. as we go along And what, what do you think about the, the whole thing with the water? Because they, they seem to be you know, putting magical stuff aside. What if it was just an hallucination caused 
by uh, whatever. I don't remember what was the, the specific poison. Um, mm. Don't even know what effects. Uh, I remember at the time wanting to go and Google it, but I never did. So <laughs> could have been as simple as that. Definitely another state's trade to go because I mean they were under, malnourished, they were underfed. Mm-hmm. The you know all of, we we get told that even when they run out of alcohol, they start trying to concoct. They seem to be honey and water, and think of it as alcohol, you know, uh, and do that, and they sort of convince themselves that that is a replacement for alcohol. So they there definitely are signs that there is something making them go matter more than even loneliness or, or something like that so whether the, the sea or something's been brushed in from the sea or they've been attacked by the elements around them and not just the seagulls at the end I, I thought they were trying to make some like meat or something with the honey or like mm-hmm. a like a honey wine or something but it takes more than like 30 seconds to do that so <laughs> exactly that's what um, i was thinking yeah. oh that was like desperation trying to trying to um drink were they drinking fuel because I, I wondered, did they, they sweeten yeah. it with the honey? Was it like a fuel mm-hmm. that they were drinking? Well, it could have been, it could have been uh, like pure um, ethanol or something mm-hmm. that, that, that they were doing with that. I never thought about that at all. But that is definitely another thing, which would have made them even sicker and more, you know, their mind mm-hmm. even more mm-hmm. twisted, etc. Yeah, absolutely. Hmm. Mm. Yeah, it's it's got so many interesting little push points and, and but like especially the I, I think it's really funny in places. Like there are a couple of lines that I think are for as dark and as miserable as it is a lot of time it's very funny. Like the bit the bit towards the end where uh, <laughs> Robert Pattinson's character starts attacking uh, Willem Dafoe verbally. You know, you can, and it's just a cuss word after cuss word after cuss word after cuss word. Um, basically, Willem Dafoe points out he's just been speaking in sea shanties for most of the film. Um, he basically says, great way with words there, uh, <laughs> Tom. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you're like, yeah, you're right about that. That's that, that's that's very true, you know. Um, so there are lots of little moments of, of like, dark humour uh, mm-hmm. without it ever being, like, a, a raddest kind of laugh-out-loud film at any stage. Mm-hmm. I remember when when he goes and emptying the the chamber pot, and I could see it happening. Is like, you, you you're not going to throw that against the wind, are you? No, you, you are. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Just funny, not but but it, it it also leads to the the question or otherwise that like what genre is this film? Like, it sort of is genreless in a lot of ways. It is a horror film in some ways. It's a psychological kind of study in, in some others. It has lots of different things going on, and yet it has elements of dark comedy. It has elements of, of uh, you know, art house film or whatever you want to put it. So it, it, it is kind of a mismatch of, of a lot of different mm-hmm. things. And I think that's one of the reasons it's kind of hard to pin down in terms mm-hmm. of, like, I didn't know what to expect, but, like, he's, you were saying at the start, mm-hmm. Steve, like you can't have any expectations of it because it is sort of a bit of everything uh, in a lot of ways. Yeah, there, there's not an enough plot for the amount of, of questions that are raised. Mm-hmm. Uh, I would rather if they, you know, however else, or whatever is, is going on in their head or what triggers all that, if they are stick to, you know, um, physiological causes, mm-hmm. intoxication, poisoning, whatever, or go the, the supernatural route, you know, sentient seagulls or some mysticism. The way that both were mixed is just added to the to, to, to the confusion and the plot was already thin enough. So it mm-hmm. opens all these speculations and I guess it works for some people. Just you know the endless possibilities and you can be whatever you want. And, but um, it, it makes it really, really hard if you are actually trying to figure it out. Yeah. yeah. What about the mermaid then? Ah, oh, God. What's your reading um, of the, bar- the mermaid? Well, it's very rare to see a depiction of a vulva on screen. Oh, I'll tell you that. <laughs> so I guess it would have to be on a mermaid yeah. of all of all the creatures. Um, 
I, I, I was not expecting. I was like, right, okay. I guess there's no um, consensus about you know, can we show this or not. And then second thought, how would it work exactly? <laughs> yeah, moving on. So I, I guess it depends on your interpretation of whether there's something magical or supernatural going on or if it's just them being crazy. If so okay, so there's the like the the um the wooden sculpture in the beginning that mm-hmm. was hidden in the bed, which seemed a little odd that it, the way it was hidden and the way he kept digging it out. It almost mm-hmm. looked like hair that he was pulling out of the yeah. uh, out of the bed. And so there's that. So if this is something that multiple multiple people have experienced, then is it a hallucination because of that item, or is it something that's really happening? I'm not sure. I think you could look at it from this magical supernatural standpoint, where the the seagulls were aggressive and were uh, were the souls of dead sailors before, and killing it kind of angered the whatever it is uh, going on. So you could look at it that way, that that's, they're being punished for it. Um, I'm not sure if it's, I would, I, I don't know if it would make it more or less interesting if that was real versus hallucinations. Yeah. Hmm. yeah. I, I, I took it as an hallucination. Um, extrapolate it from it, the statue. Yeah. It, it very rarely appears consistent as one thing because there is that bit where she's almost playing dead and then she becomes alive but the way that it's cut it's kind of happens very you know quick between one another and there's definitely that idea that you know they are sexually frustrated as well so it's kind of like the um the embodiment of that in some way but but like mermaids classically in that sense with the sirens etc are often seen as uh like temptresses or that they are, are basically tempting weak men and in the case of, of this film they are tempting Ephraim or that version of the man at the start and not Thomas uh, not that we see that necessarily but that, that's that's what I'm seeing so it again could possibly lead into the idea of you know that, that who's the alpha male and the transference of that uh, through the film in some ways that, that sort of tox- toxic masculinity that pervades throughout, throughout the film Mm-hmm. and so and plus the, the title of the movie The Lighthouse it's it could be a it could be interpreted as interpreted as something phallic mm-hmm. uh, you know the two men together in the lighthouse and you know um, it, some symbolism there but so there's that and there's also what is the light in the lighthouse and why did Thomas keep Ephraim out of the lighthouse mm-hmm. is there something special about the light about the light in the lighthouse or is it just more craziness <laughs> it's very I Pulp Fiction wasn't it he <laughs> was hiding something or someone or the course of some predecessor there which would be mm-hmm. I guess too obvious um, but yeah he was very protective of the lighthouse and never figured that one out. Um, now that you mention phallic objects, I wonder if there's something to do with him being protective of himself to some degree. I don't know. Yeah. It's, uh, it's, I think it's one of those very quintessential, like, here, here's a vague ending. Here's, yeah. here's, kind of to be whatever you want I know Eggers was asked about it and he said well I could have shown you what was inside it but then it would have affected you too (laughs) (laughs) which I thought right okay nice way to sidestep the question of whatever so again whatever's inside the lighthouse is whatever you want it to be as it turns out in some ways your reason or your reading of it can just be enhanced or deprecated by whatever you think is inside the light. But mm-hmm. it definitely does drive me more mad. It's like he sort of becomes one with the light, doesn't it? Because mm-hmm. it sort of envelops him. Mm-hmm. Back to, to the theory that they are the same person. How would it work at the end when um, Thomas, the, the younger one, 
uh, he's been eaten by the seagull. So how? Oh, I, I think he's dead at the end. I think he basically killed yeah. himself by everything that happened. Yeah, yeah. I think he killed so one he, side he of the dominance. Be the older man, or was he already seeing himself? As you, you see that? I, how would it hmm. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> or is it's okay. not a perfect theory? Or is Ifram really does Ifram exist and Thomas is a hallucination? Hmm. Defoe's character is hallucination and young Tom is real. I guess that would make it. Yeah, I, I think from, think of it from a masculine point of view. If you were going to invent a companion for yourself, I mm-hmm. doubt you would invent a younger companion. You'd want somebody that was older that you could talk to and learn from, especially if you're by yourself and isolated like that. I think if you were going to do it either way, you would invent William Defoe. Uh, and have that because like William Defoe is a lot of things that he isn't he's like, like I was saying, he's very verbose he's, he's very well spoken he's you know he's got good diction he seems to know everything that's going on at all times and it's like uh it's the internal war is so, just about kind of the light and what he's making him do but like and 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 physically he's he's lesser than him because he has the bad teeth and the, the you know the old run down bit of it so he's not threatened by him that way i think if anything thomas wake is the hallucination or the the invented other self for the companionship because he kills the younger guy that would have been uh, in my theory anyway he kills the other person that would have been his underling and the person that he was going to be companion with so he he probably didn't want that he wanted somebody that was that was older could that he could learn from is what i'm what i'm possibly suggesting is my theory but in that case, why imagine a man, or uh, why the, the mentor, if you were alone and young and you had the capacity or the drugs to, to imagine anything, you know, you just imagine a companion, or at least someone who was nice to you. He wasn't learning much, he was just being beaten down and insulted constantly. I think, that's the, I think that's the. I think that's the examination of masculinity in the film. I mean, he he, he mm. didn't have a feminine side. I mean, the only feminine thing that he did imagine, as we point out, is sort of this mermaid, which is like mm. he can't even anatomically do it very well. You know what I mean? In his imagination, mm. he's he's like right. He doesn't know enough about women or or things like that to kind of make that judgment. But he can see what an older man, and it might have been his father. You know, he might have been projecting mm. onto his father or something from from that kind of person because it is sort of that relationship, isn't it? You know mm-hmm. that, that comes through, and the fact that he's kind of at the end taken over from his father and replacing his father, and he doesn't have any need for his father. And at the end, so he's like, I mean, I'm reading very about twenty steps beyond in a lot of ways, but I mean, it sort of is the one thing that makes sense from the film for me uh, about what it could be. I begin because that was one of my first thoughts that sort of, at the very start of the film, it sort of presents that duality in the split screen mm-hmm. and all of that kind of stuff going the way along. From a point of view, hmm. yeah, th- there's even that scene towards the end where he even explicitly he says something like, um, "You're not my father. Um, you're not my." He's mm. kind of uh, when he when Defoe tells him, "You have a way with words." Or yes, um, <laughs> so and then he he does make him do kind of, uh, but he's I'm not sure I'm not sure why if he tells him like there is this this power dynamic um so yeah i know it's i guess there's a so with all this ambiguity i think there's um there is there's a line between and chris we've read another series recently kind of yeah this discussion about being am, being ambiguous not providing the answers i think there's a line between i don't want to say laziness but kind of like um just avoiding having to wrap things up this like mm-hmm. i presented all these questions and it's up to you i'll see you later and figure mm-hmm. it out and there's also there's the other side of it where it's it's done well and it's like okay i'm going to leave you with these with these ideas and you you can think about it and it's going to drive you crazy for a while and you're going to constantly think about it and come up with theories mm-hmm. and and you'll always talk mm-hmm. about it with people who have seen it or read it and there'll always be a discussion so mm-hmm. 
where does this fall in that for you, for both of you? Yeah, I thought oh, it's, it's completely open, and I think uh, I, I would like a little bit more guidance. At least there's no need to explain everything, but uh, something. I, I didn't have enough to go on, even you know, being warned that it was an unreliable narrator, and I was trying to look for clues in dialogue, behavior, whatever. I think I, I, I missed them all. I got to a point where, I, and it's not a movie that keeps you engaged. It has moments that awaken mm-hmm. you. It makes it forces you to pay attention, but it's very easy to drift off because, like this was saying, it's very samey throughout. It kind of has that lulls you into whatever is, is going on. So I, by the end, I was like, okay, what was the point? You know, it had nothing to do with it. I mean, we talked about it certainly with the, the Southern Reach trilogy is the other thing we're referring to which you finished the weekend and I, I think in, in both cases it comes down to the expectation of what you think is going to happen and mm-hmm. we talked in, on just earlier on the weekend about the fact that I actually had made peace with the fact that in the Southern Reach trilogy I sort of knew we weren't going to get any answers before we actually got to the end and was disappointed so I could sort of build myself up whereas this one I sort of felt like I needed answers because of the sameness of the way through it. Like my, my mm-hmm. original thought didn't really deviate throughout the film. Mm-hmm. And so by the time I get to the end and no real changes happen, I sort of felt a bit, uh, I feel unfulfilled in, in that regard. But again, that's what the rereading, the rewatching kind of gets to do. So that you come to a point where, I suppose it depends what type of person you are. I think I've, decided, I've realized that I've become the person that I tend to rationalize it think about it for a while and then come to a thing right that's what it means for me at a certain point so so that i stop myself going crazy because i could just go in the end of the loop of keeping on thinking about it but what if it's that what if it's that what's that and i'm not you don't revisit that until somebody gives you some new information or some new part of the story that you didn't see and you go no for me it's about that and that's okay i put it in the box but yeah it's more about the progression and, and the big difference between the two things i'll say i was i was never bored reading southern reach trilogy at any stage the whole way through like it's always mm. like fascinating and interesting the whole way through whereas it points to this board's the wrong word but it is that statedness of like we're just seeing more representation of this male comrad camaraderie like we see them drinking an awful lot the dialogue doesn't make an awful lot of sense especially from defoe's character it's very hard to discern this film is almost impossible to watch without subtitles. I would, mm-hmm. I would say, um, mm-hmm. especially to make, make what they're saying out. And even then, like it's of limited use. <laughs> I would say in, in 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 some ways. So there is less to hold your interest, I think, in a moment to moment basis than there is, say, in, in the other, in the other thing. And maybe that plays into the part of how you feel about the ending, then, uh, because of that experience the whole way through. Mm-hmm. I felt, yeah, it was a waste. Um, one person or two, I think it was a waste of life there. Mm-hmm. Well, I think life agrees with you, Susanna, because uh, <laughs> they don't put men in lighthouses anymore. Yeah. <laughs> no? no, I think you, they you, push you, a need, <laughs> you need the right temperament. I, yeah. Growing up, I, I used to say that I would love to you know, be in the lighthouse, be by, by myself. By the way, yeah. I thought you know, I had this very romantic idea of being a lighthouse keeper. Don't ask. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, it probably would be awful. You know, I'll be bored with yeah. it within a week, and then we'd still have you know, another six months or whatever to go. So it, it, it's um, yeah, very bleak. Imagine the movie without all the unreliability and weird scenes and whatnot it was just the story of one man or two uh, mm. stuck in that island who would be bleak as hell just yeah. we would be you know begging for the seagull to come <laughs> just <laughs> spreading bait <laughs> <laughs> take me yeah. <laughs> yeah seagull food and there is that scene towards the end where Defoe's, Defoe's looking down on Ephraim and he has it, his eyes are the lighthouse or he becomes kind of the lighthouse yes. and he's, he sees him kind of like he's been exposed or he's he kind of hide I wasn't sure what the lighthouse represented in that in that uh, context of what does the lighthouse itself for you know so the lighthouse um, you know it, was it was it something seeing him was it something that he 
he couldn't escape. I, I wasn't sure what that meant, but it seemed like a like it was supposed to be an important scene. It was only a couple seconds, but it felt like it was significant. I just don't know what it meant. Mm-hmm. It, I, I had the impression that it was almost judging him. You know, mm-hmm. and that, you know, Lighthouse is supposed to be guides. Never had that impression from the Lighthouse that it was. And so just like here, you know, it wasn't a saving grace. It was, it was very oppressive. It was always looming over there. It was... Um, yeah, yeah. The I, one, I don't the want one to say thing, God, but uh, something to that effect. Well, on on that point, the one thing that uh, Eggers has said, the if he based this in anything, it was in the Prometheus uh, legend, um, and so that it definitely has a Greek god look to it. That scene, the the naked Defoe, um, sitting down judging, in other words, but the, again, the idea of the previous that he steals the fire, i.e. the lighthouse, the light at the top of the lighthouse is, is sort of like a very loose allegory for, for, for what that is. But as we sort of see in the end of the film, um, Robert Pattinson's character pays the price for that in, in a lot of ways, you know, uh, be careful what you wish for in a lot of ways. So it's not a direct retelling of, of the Promethean legend or anything. It's... Um, it's just kind of using a lot of the ideas and themes about it, but it sort of like pays homage to that bit with the shining of the, of the eyes, the kind of like, even if it's Poseidon looking down on him, it has that sort of look, just give him a trident in one hand and he's, and he's good. Hmm. Well, that's so interesting. I can see it if it was something to do with the relationship between Prometheus mm-hmm. and Zeus. Yeah. The way that... Um, they, they used to be body before they created humans and everything like that. Um, yeah, I can see that the Prometheus being tricked and punished for, the, but it wouldn't apply to the movie. It, it didn't. It didn't try to steal anything, not even for himself. Well, apart from the light, he wants to get in to see the light in the he lighthouse. Like that's the, the light, idea. Yeah. But it, that's that's that. I mean, that I think. He doesn't say it's a direct retelling or anything. It's just sort of influenced by some of the ideas. I think is is, is more what Eggers was saying. He's he's always just very aloof about what his films mean in general. Even The Witch or Well Northman's a bit more straightforward, I suppose, in so far as it's sort of mm. Viking retelling. Um, in a lot of ways, Revenge Tale, uh, a bit more straightforward. But this one definitely is meant to be obscure. Like I don't think he ever wants to say what exactly what he thought it was. Mm-hmm. I think. In his case, I think he, as a filmmaker, will probably give enough red herrings, enough things that it can be multiple things. I think that, that's the way you would write or design that rather than mm-hmm. just kind of say, oh, I'm only indicating one thing. Because if, mm-hmm. if that's what he wanted to do, you would have given us more direct answers. Yeah, but, but like, I can see the dynamic. I can see the Prometheus Zeus dynamic yeah. and Poseidon just observing everything and uh, doing it. Because no one thinks about Poseidon that much and he's always mm. he's always there. people forget he's the brother of Zeus and yeah. uh, he controls much of the world so, yeah. okay, that, but that would be a much more interesting story there was no need for <laughs> this direction <laughs> I would definitely mm. watch that another patient of um, of Prometheus yeah. meet uh, on, on the lighthouse oh, that would be brilliant that could be cool Wow, that could be. That's a whole other angle to it. Mm-hmm. I guess too many this... options, not enough plot. I think I think stories like this appeal to that part of our brains who'd like to yeah. dissect and think about it and try to come up with solutions. Mm-hmm. And I think um, that's why I wondered: Do we really want like a song of ice and fire to end? If you really think about it, is it is it funner to speculate and to wonder than to actually know? Because you'll be how many people will be actually be happy with how it ends? Yeah. Unless it's how you think it will end, you won't you won't be happy with it. Because there's it, been so much space left between the books now that the, like there is no doubt that somebody or a lot of people have come up with far better ideas and endings than than one person can do. Like that's just the way that was the problem with. Like those other TV shows that we've talked about, when series run on for so long, for six series or something, people will come up with better endings than actually will be there. And because people are in inv- these kind of shows or these kind of films, 
want you to speculate, so people will go to the internet and speculate as, as, as a group, then the actual truth of what comes out or what the, the definite end at the end, unless it's vague, which gives you the option for whatever ending that you wanted to be put in, then it's almost certainly not going to work for a lot of people. Especially because people will then start to pick holes in it. Uh, because of one minor incident that happened three seasons ago, <laughs> you know, it means that that couldn't happen, you know. I, people are stupid sometimes. I, I want to know. My theories are quite simple. I, I've, <laughs> Har Har Haramita sent me down this rabbit hole of theories, and some of them are just no. Have you actually read the beginning of the book? Do you have any concept of foreshadowing? Anyway, um, no, and I don't need them to be wild. I just. Yeah. I just need them. <laughs> just anything, I will not complain. Even if I have several, if one gets close, I'll be very happy. But I would be happy, <laughs> however it ends. And that that one, I, I really need to know. I can just speculate, and then not make it open-handed. I'm going to be angry. And and to be fair, the ending that we got in the TV series could have worked if it had been given more time to just it. Like the problem was, that it was all very sudden. It wasn't necessarily that the ending was unrealistic or didn't it just felt like it was unearned it was unearned and it didn't fit it didn't fit the beginning it didn't fit the the characters their personality their mm. story arc um it didn't fit that we, like i can see how john snow could have killed danny or why he was spoilers still <laughs> yes no one no one knows about that at all yeah sorry <laughs> Well, maybe someone who tunes in to listen to us talking about this movie once and you're going to be very surprised, so I'm sorry. <laughs> Wrapping up, I can see that it wouldn't bother me, but there's a lot of the stuff that happened that made absolutely no sense taking into account what came before. It's yeah, kind of like the movie, like uh, apart from the ending, which was predictable because you know, these two are doomed, um, you know, it could be anything i think if you post the, the the film halfway and you know let's speculate what's going to happen you know someone uh, would get it right even if it was just that they're going to die because it would be the the simplest explanation and they would be right why uh then everyone would be right because 10 explanations would say and i think that is a bit lazy I don't know if if mm. if you're gonna start the story. I mean, whoever wrote it or directed it, or they, they must have an idea, and maybe they think it's not a very good idea. And I, and I, I see this in books a lot. Uh, people don't know how to finish exactly, or they are afraid to, to finalize it, or uh, because once it's done, it's done. People don't have room for their own imaginings and. Uh, you know, write their fanfic scenarios on them. So it, it is very hard to wrap a story. And it's sad as well. You know, and then two years later you think, oh, I should have done that. Well, tough. Write another one. Mm -hmm. and, and this felt like that, like someone who couldn't decide on a reason for that ending. They probably had the ending set, but they couldn't decide on the reason for that ending and just left lots of open and, and just call it experimental or yeah. the unreliable narrator and let the viewer decide. <sighs> there is a place for that, but I, I, I find it lazy, floppy. Okay. Okay. Yes, I guess, does, it, does this work as... Um, I think this story, does it work better as being ambiguous and being... Because I, I don't know that this one would... I don't know. If we had all the answers, would it be as talked about the way it's presented? Mm. I think it's still a beautiful piece of filmmaking, regardless of, of 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 the narrative beats and stories. And let's be clear: like this is an extremely popular film. Eggers is an extremely popular filmmaker because of the way that he tells his stories. So a lot of people this one hundred percent work for it. And like I'll be clear: I do like the movie. I just don't love it the way that I feel like I should probably probably love it because of how beautifully it's made and kind of the things that it does try to do. It's just not it's not quite that level. It doesn't hit the heights of some of the other films that are that are a bit in this kind of genre, mm -hmm. this kind of ilk. Um so there's a lot mm -hmm. to like, 
but uh, it just isn't mm. isn't amazing for me in the way that, that, that maybe it could have been. Visually, it has a lot of character. I mean, seriously, the, the island itself, the lighthouse, that is the character on, on its own. Um, mm. And it is different. Um, again, usually, black and white movies, I find them hard, especially when they're done these days. There's always a reason for this. They, they tend to be a bit um, I don't want to say arrogant, what's the best word? Pretentious. Pretentious, yes, exactly. I, I, I didn't feel that with a particular movie. And, 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 and there, there, was, there was a reason. Everything fit, mm. with, but it was almost scene by scene. Um, as a whole, I liked the story, I liked the, the engagement. So, not bad. I mean, I, I still watch it until the end. And I still remember most of it, and I'm talking about it, so mm. fine. You know, it's probably something I'm not going to watch again, but I don't hate it. I just wish it had been a little bit more specific or explicit. You know, they had a little bit more to go on. That's fair. <laughs> cool. Yeah. Well, cool. Yeah, that was a uh, very interesting, very interesting uh, film. So, anything else uh, either of you can think of? No, no, not for me. Just no. wish that girl should made more movies by the stage. <laughs> it, it, it was worth it for the discussion. I always leave this discussion and I'm like, I so bad I watch I watch that movie. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's good to have uh, different different uh, opinions and have a mix because if we all like it, then it's you know it's fine. But I think having kind of mixed reactions is you see because we get different perspectives and different points of view that we even if, whether you love it or hate it, either way you kind of like oh that wasn't too bad or yeah you're right that sucked. So you know it's 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 good cool. it's good to have op- different opinions for sure. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And not get it. I feel like that's <laughs> less and less these days. And if you disagree, then you're you know you're a horrible person. Kind of, but no, it's, it's kind of nice. <laughs> so, but anyway, <laughs> it's a whole another, it's a whole another episode. But anyway, yeah. uh, so in the meantime, uh, Susanna, where can people find you? Uh, you can find me on the page chewing forums, on X at Chronodendron, and on my YouTube channel, Den of the Weird. And Chris. You can find me on my YouTube channel, which is just my name, Chris Mullen, or on the page to informs. Nice. Well, thank you both for taking time. I know the weather's getting better, so it's it's good to to yeah. be out and enjoy it. But thanks for taking the time this uh, this afternoon, I guess, for you guys. So. Mm-hmm. Thanks, Steve. All right. Until next time. Thank thanks, you. everybody. See you then. Until next time. Bye.